What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? What kind of worshiper are you? Are you a reverent worshiper or are you a careless worshiper? Does, does worship occupy a place of significance in your life? Or has worship been reduced to a place of less importance in your weekly priorities? Look, let me begin with some introspective questions, all right? These are questions that I've asked myself this week, and these are questions that I'd like for you to answer. Don't raise your hands. Don't yell out. Uh, you just answer these questions between you and God. Here's the first question. Have you made promises to God that you haven't kept? Maybe it was a week ago, maybe it was a month ago, maybe it was several years ago. You promised God something, but as of yet, you haven't fulfilled that promise. Maybe you fulfilled it for a few days, a few weeks, but man, you stopped fulfilling it some time ago. Do you place more emphasis on how worship is done than who it is that we are worshiping? A lot of people do that today. They can only worship in, in one way, and they sit back, and, and they're so focused on how worship is being done that they lose focus of who is the person that we are worshiping. Does your mind often wander during the service? I mean, you're here, but you're not here. You're here, but, but you're not engaged. Your, your mind is somewhere else. Are you a sporadic church attender? <laughs> There's a lot of sporadic church attenders. George Barna, who's a church research expert, says that in this day and age, there's not less people attending church. People are attending church less. We even find that is the case in our church. Many people who used to attend every Sunday are now attending every other Sunday. Life happens. I'm sure God understands, Brian, and church, worshiping together becomes less important to us. Other things become more important. Is your schedule so busy during the week? I mean, you say, Brian, you just don't get it, man. I'm up early in the morning, and I'm, I'm working late at night, or I'm with the kids, or I'm going to soccer practice, or I'm taking them to dance lessons, or I'm taking care of my parents. I'm so busy that during the week, I just don't have time to spend time with God. Sunday is the day that I worship. The other days are for me. Sunday is God's day. Was A.W. Tozer, he's one of my uh, favorite writers, favorite preachers, who made this statement. If you do not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him on one day a week. There, there is no such thing known in heaven as Sunday worship unless it is accompanied by Monday worship and Tuesday worship. And Wednesday worship. I, I, I'm afraid, church, and my heart is really heavy this morning. Because I'm afraid as, as believers in the United States and believers in South Florida, we become careless in the way that we worship God. We become irreverent in the way that we approach Him. You see, a positive answer to any of those questions that I just asked a moment ago should be a warning sign 
in your life. It should be a warning sign in my life. I'm afraid that for many believers, worship has lost its place of significance. We've allowed the busyness of our lives to affect our worship. To many people, worship has become only a Sunday morning experience a couple of times a month. The simple truth is this. We were created for worship. Allow that to sink into your mind and heart today. The reason God created you was to worship him. God didn't create us so that we could become successful. God didn't create us so that we could make a lot of money or so that we could build families or even have fun. Now, he graciously allows us to do all of those things, but that's not why you were created. It's not why I was created. I was created for worship. And you were created for worship. We were created to glorify him through our lives. As a result, he should occupy the place of significance. He should occupy the place of supreme importance in our lives. Solomon deals with that in the passage of scripture that we're looking at today. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The first seven verses. I'll read, put them up on the screen, follow along if you have your Bibles today. Notice what Solomon says. I'm reading out of the NLT. You follow along in the translation you have. As you enter God's house, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. I said, I read that this week and I thought, man, what a direct comment. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises. Don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven, and you are on earth. God is so much greater than you are. So let your words be few. Too much activity gives you restless dreams, and too many words make you a fool. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry. And he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap, like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we recognize that you're here with us today. You've promised us that when a handful of people come together, that you're there. We're so grateful that we don't have to beg you to come. We don't have to bribe you to come. You want to be here with us. And we thank you for that. And Father, you come for the purpose of being worshipped. I pray that you'd help us this morning to be honest with ourselves. God, this has been a a rough passage for me. You've kind of beat me up in this passage today. Father, you know my heart, I confess before you, and I confess before our congregation that at times I'm guilty of some of the things that we're talking about today. God, I pray you'd help us to realize above anything else this morning that you are worthy of our worship. Help us not just to be Sunday worshipers, but help us to be Monday worshipers and Tuesday worshipers and Thursday worshipers and Friday worshipers. Lord, may you occupy that place of supreme importance in our life. God, help us not to relegate you to a place of secondary importance or even farther down the ladder. 
God, I pray you'd help us to recognize you for who you are and to worship you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the passage of scripture that we're looking at today, Solomon addresses the irreverent, careless worship practices of his day. Uh, evidently, and you remember Solomon's on a pursuit, and Solomon was observing things, and, and we've seen the last few weeks how Solomon even walked into the temple, and he observed how people were worshiping. Well, evidently, as Solomon walked in the temple, and he observed worshipers, he, he noticed that many Yahweh worshipers, many Jehovah worshipers, many God worshipers had become negligent in the way that they approached God. It wasn't that they had stopped doing the things that they should do. Many of them were habitually, were ritually falling through, following through the motions of their religious experience. But there was no meaning. There, there was no passion. Uh, they were void of, of any, uh, of any um, significance, any, any outright passion to uh, worship and honor God. They simply were doing what they had been told to do. And that, 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 that happens to us on a regular basis. Please don't think today that, that the words of Solomon were just for a group of people that lived some uh, 2,500 years ago. The words of Solomon apply to each and every one of us. So notice with me as we look at the passage today, notice several admonitions that Solomon gives to us today. The first thing that I wrote down in my notes is this, guard yourself against careless worship. The, the first words of the chapter serve as a warning. He says this, as you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Some other translations begin by saying, guard yourself, watch out for yourself as you enter into the house of God. Here's what he says, as you walk into church, to use our New Testament 21st century vernacular, he says, as you walk into church, watch your step. As you come to worship with God's people, guard your feet. Now, I'm sure this morning that we could and possibly should take that admonition literally and physically. He, he could be saying, don't trip when you come into God's house. All right, I get that. There's been times, I think some of you have seen me. I kind of walk off the platform and I kind of trip walking off the platform. Years ago, I was uh, singing when I was in college. I was singing in this men's group and we, uh, we traveled the country and we were in this church one time, six of us guys, we'd stand up and sing and then, and then we'd come down and the preacher would stand up and preach. And so one day we'd sang and, and I was coming down off the platform and, and, and I tripped and literally took a nosedive right into the front row. And the pastor comes up, man, just as cool as a cucumber, and says, guys, thank you so much for the song and the dance, Brian. Thank you so much for the dance. That was good. And so, uh, you know, obviously we can take it practically and say, man, don't trip when you come into God's house. But you know and I know that Solomon is not speaking in literal terms. He's not talking about us not physically tripping. He is speaking spiritually. And here's what Solomon says. He says, watch your spiritual steps. Don't fall spiritually when you are in God's house. Now, you might sit back like I did as I began to pray through this passage several weeks ago and think, man, Solomon, what in the world are you talking about? It seems as if church would be the one place that we could go without falling spiritually. I mean, I could get it if Solomon say, hey, you know what? When you go to that restaurant that has a bar there, watch out that you don't fall spiritually. And when you're turning on the television, run past those channels that you know you shouldn't watch. Don't fall spiritually. We get that. But how in the world can we fall spiritually in church? I mean, how can we sin? How can we, to use Solomon's terminology, how can we do evil while we are in church. That's what Solomon is talking about. What I wrote down in my notes, the next point is this. Here's what Solomon is saying. It is more important to listen to God's voice than to perform acts of worship. <laughs> Let me say it again. 
Please let that sink in. It is more important to listen to God's voice than to perform acts of worship. Here's what, here's what Solomon is saying. The simple truth is you can do the right thing the wrong way. You, you can come to church and you can, you can raise your voice with everybody while you can even raise your hands with everybody. You can participate in everything. You can do the right things, but you can do it in the wrong way. Externally, you look like you have it all together. Everyone around you might look at you and say, man, look at that guy worship, or, or look at that lady worship. Externally, you look like you are the exemplary worshiper. But here's the idea. When God watches you worship, he doesn't look at the outside. God looks at the inside. And so God knows what are the motives of our worship. God knows what are the passions of our worship. God knows whether we are worshiping sincerely or whether we are worshiping insincerely. God knows whether we're worshiping reverently or whether we are worshiping irreverently. Now, as you read through Scripture, we're certainly not the first generation to have made this grievous error. The Old Testament repeatedly demonstrates the, the carelessness of Israel's worship. And man, uh, I could pull out scores of examples of the Old Testament, how Israel carelessly worshiped God. Let me give you just a couple. The first is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You're familiar with Israel's first king, Saul. God had commanded Saul, Saul, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the armies and I want you to go wipe out the Amalekites. I want, you to, I want you to just take care of all of them, all right? And I want you to not only get rid of the Amalekites, but, 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 but all of their possessions. Burn their gold, their silver, kill their animals. Listen, I want them to be completely destroyed. Saul rationalizes in his mind. He gets to the camp of the Amalekites, and he sees, man, he sees gold bars. Why in the world would God want us to destroy gold bars? And he sees these, these beautifully plump sheep and cattle that would be great to sacrifice. They'd be great to eat as well. And so in his mind, he doesn't obey what God tells him to do. He rationalizes in, in his mind. He obeys according to his criteria. So here comes Samuel. The prophet Samuel. And Saul looks at Samuel and says, hey, I've done what God commanded me to do. And Samuel says, have you really? Well, why do I hear the bleeding of the sheep? Why do I hear, you know, the noise of animals that you should have destroyed? Saul's response was, hold, hold, hold on, Samuel, you don't understand. I saved that for worship. I, I, I saved those things so that we could worship God together. And I'm sure Saul's sitting back thinking, Samuel's going to say, what a terrific answer. What a, what a godly, I didn't think about that, Saul. That's not the way Samuel responded. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel makes one, I believe, one of the most powerful statements in the Old Testament. He says this, has the Lord as great of delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. L listen, Saul, you're justifying your incorrect response with an act of worship. You cannot cover up your disobedience by a religious act. You cannot do it. To God, obedience is better than sacrifice. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable. During Hosea's time, it, it, Israel had, uh, had followed other gods. They were, uh, they were uh, 
synchronistic in the way that they were, that they were serving God, but, but they were serving the gods of the nations as well. And, and they were following their religious routines, but, but they had added paganism on top of the religious routines. And they thought that God was satisfied because, satisfied because they kept doing all the things that they were commanded to do in the Old Testament. In Hosea 6.6, God makes this statement, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You see, in each of these cases and countless more that we could mention this morning, Israel attempted to justify their disregard for God's commands by performing religious exercises. Now let me state that, that the answer to that is not to stop doing sacrifices. The answer is not to stop doing burnt offerings. God is not saying stop worshiping. That's not what God is saying. His admonition though is for us to examine the motive and the attitude of our worship. Uh, let me ask you a question today. How do you view God? Why do you worship? Why are you here this morning? Well, Brian's because my wife woke me up at 7.30 and said I had to be here this morning. <laughs> right? Well, hey, it's just what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be at church. God would get mad at me if I didn't come to church. So I'm here. All right? We're going out to eat with my in-laws, and so we all came to church together. Why are you here today? Or do you listen when God speaks to you. Now, 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 you and I don't offer burnt offerings. Aren't you glad that we, you know, we don't tell you, next Sunday, everybody bring a sheep and we're going to sacrifice it here on the altar. I'm, I'm really glad that, that the greatest sheep, Jesus Christ, already shed his blood so we don't have to do that anymore. But just because we don't offer burnt offerings and we don't make sacrifices, it's easy for us to say, well, this doesn't apply to us. How are we guilty of careless worship? Let me give you a couple of ways. The first is this. We are guilty of insincere worship whenever we carry out religious rituals without meaning and passion. We are guilty of careless worship whenever we carry out religious rituals without meaning and passion. Verse 1, if you look at it again, he says this. It is, it is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Okay, here's what he's saying. You know, the, the, those religious things that you do, you bring that sheep, you bring that goat, what you know you're supposed to do, and you bring that week after week, and you think God's looking down on you saying, man, that's great. But Solomon says, if you do it mindlessly, if you do it insincerely, if you don't do it from the heart, the word that Solomon uses is the word evil. It is evil in God's eyes to make mindless offerings. The ESV translates verse 1 this way, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. The word fool is used three times in this passage. The word fool is a scathing indictment. And I would remind you that Solomon is not talking to the unregenerate person that never darkens the door of the church. He's not talking to, you know, the man who beats his wife and, and the guy who doesn't provide for his kids and the one who is unfaithful to their spouse. He's talking about people that worship on a regular basis. And he uses the word fool three times. In the passage, Solomon says this, to be casual with God is foolish. To, to carry out our religious rituals without meaning or without passion offends God. God is offended when we come to worship and we really don't want to be there. Whenever we come into his presence and we're bored in his presence, when we come into his presence and we don't have anything to give him, God is offended by that. It's evil. It's sin. How do we make mindless offerings to the Lord? I've already alluded to some. I don't want to be redundant, but 
when we're not engaged during the worship service. We're giving a mindless offering to the Lord. When our minds wander during the message, we surf on Facebook, we daydream about lunch, we're mentally and spiritually disconnected. We're mindlessly observing the worship experience. We prayerlessly give an offering to the Lord. Offering time comes and we grab for something. We haven't spent any time in prayer. We haven't realized that God is worthy of our offerings to him. We haven't sat back in serious contemplation and say, God, what is it that you want me to give to you? We mindlessly perform religious acts. And Solomon says that God is offended. Here's the idea, church. God is worthy of our attention. We, We've intentionally sang that today. He is worthy. He he alone is worthy. God God is worthy of our attention. God, God is worthy of our singing. Whether you sing well or not, God is worthy of your singing. God is worthy of your offerings. God is worthy of your presence. He alone is worthy. Do you believe that today? Would you say that with me today? He is worthy. Say that with me. He is worthy. Say it again. He is worthy. Do you believe that today? You see, the nation of Israel worshipped, and they didn't worship as if God was worthy. We're guilty of insincere worship when we hear God's voice, but we do not obey his word. How often have you heard God's word? How often have you been convicted about an action? How often have you been convicted about an attitude in your life, but you failed to change it? God spoke to you. Whether you were reading the word all by yourself, whether you were listening to someone on the radio, whether you were in church, God spoke to you. You heard his voice. You got the message but you failed to obey his word. In the moment, it resonated with you, but man, when you got in the car and the kids started yelling, all of a sudden, you forgot, you put to the back of your mind what a holy, righteous, omnipotent, all-powerful God just said to you. You heard his voice, but you didn't listen. You, You did not obey. James says it this way in James 4, 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then don't do it. Solomon says it's much better to listen to God than it is to make religious sacrifices. There's a second thing that he says in the passage. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not keep it. I venture to say that probably all of us are guilty of this. There's probably been times in our life when we have promised God something, and then for one reason or another, we haven't fulfilled that promise. During the First and Second World War, those were known as foxhole decisions. You've heard of foxhole decisions, those soldiers that were in the foxholes during World War I and World War II, they were fearing for their life, cried out to God, God, if you get me out of this situation, God, if you get me out of this foxhole, then I will do this for you, or God, I will do that for you, a foxhole decision, and God and his mercy got them out of the foxhole and got them back home, and they forgot about the commitment, the promise that they had made to God. Solomon says it's better not to make a promise than to make one and not fulfill it. Many Christians have made such commitments to the Lord. We promised, okay, God, I I promise you I'm going to quit drinking. Uh, God, I promise that that I'm going to stop looking at pornography. God, God, I promise that's the last cuss word that's going to come out of my mouth. All right, I'm never going to say that to my wife again. I promise. God, I promise that I'm going to faithfully attend church. God, you know what? I promise you I'm going to serve you. 
God, I promise that I am going to give to the Lord's work. Yet after a few days, a few weeks, or a few months, we no longer follow through with the commitment that we made. God didn't put a gun to our head. God didn't make us make the commitment. We promised something to God voluntarily, and yet we haven't fulfilled it. That's what Solomon addresses in his verses. Notice he says a couple of things about it. He says, first of all, rash promises reveal a foolish heart. Notice verse 4, he says this, he says, when you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through, for God takes no pleasure in fools. I already mentioned the word fool, it's found three times. It's one of the harshest words in the Bible. Here's what the word fool means in the Bible. It speaks of a person that is deprived of the ability to reason. Someone who is mentally challenged, someone who is intellectually disabled. Here's what God is saying. God is saying, man, when you, when you make a promise to me and you do not fulfill it, that's foolish. You're acting like a disabled person. You're acting like a person that doesn't have the ability to reason and make right decisions. That's foolish. The second thing that he says is this, rash promises often reveal a selfish heart. Often, the only reason that we make a promise is because we want something from God. We try to negotiate with him. You know, it's kind of like a quid pro quo. Okay, God, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. God, if you scratch my back, then guess what? I'm going to scratch yours. God, if you give me what I want, then I will give you what you want. Wow, how foolish. As if I can negotiate with the creator of the universe. As if you can negotiate with the creator of the universe we do it selfishly as if God owes us something it demonstrates a selfish heart rash promises thirdly reveal a fearless heart that's actually what he's alluding to in the passage what Solomon is showing that such promises show a lack of fear we, we fail to realize that God is on a different level than us. That's why he says, God is in heaven. Remember, God is in heaven and you're on earth. Let your words be few. Fear God. And he ends the passage in verse 7 saying the same thing. Fear God. And by the way, he ends the book saying the exact same thing. Fear God. I'm so thankful that when it says that, it doesn't mean that we have to stand in a corner and we're scared to death of God, but it means that there's a reverential awe for God. There's a trust for God in my life. I realize that his plan is better than mine. His ways are better than mine. When he tells me to jump, I jump because he knows what's good for me. When he tells me to act, I act. Why? Because he is God. He is in heaven, and I'm on earth. I recognize him in my life. But because we don't fear him, we make promises and then excuse away our inability to make the promise. Solomon already deals with the contingency plan in the verse. Notice, notice in verse 6 what he says. I like how he follows through. He says, don't let your mouth make you to sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. Here's what took place. All right, in the Old Testament, they made a commitment. Whether they signed a commitment card, whether they, you know, sent something in email, you know, made a phone call, somehow, somehow they made a commitment saying, okay, I promise that I'm going to give to the temple this amount on this day. When the time came, guess what the temple authorities did they sent somebody to your house to collect now could you imagine if we did that today if we sent someone by your house to collect we're not going to do that all right they did that in the old testament and he said so here's what happened the temple messenger comes to collect the vow the promise that you made and you give him an excuse hey you know what i'm so sorry when i made that decision i didn't realize that the iphone 6 was coming out and and uh and uh, man, there's just been a lot more expenses, and so I'm just not going to be able to do it. Please forgive me. He said, don't make an excuse for your commitments. 
Don't excuse away your lack of fulfilling your promises as if you can make a promise to a holy, righteous God and then just excuse it away. He says, do not do that. And he makes that statement, for God will be angry. What's the answer then? What's the answer? If you go through the passage Solomon gives us in verse 2, he says this, let your words be few. In verse 4, he says, when you make a promise to God, don't delay in fulfilling it. In verse 4, he says, keep the promises you make to him. In verse 7, he says, fear God instead. Let me ask you a question today. Have you been guilty of careless worship? Has there been a way in your life that you've, either you've worshipped him mindlessly, you've worshipped him inconsistently, you've made promises that you haven't fulfilled? Have you been careless in your worship? If so, confess it. I love 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess it. Change it. Make sure that your worship honors and pleases God. So the first thing he says is this, guard against careless worship. He says a second thing, and I know my time's running, but let me show you this. This is so important. He says, pursue genuine worship. Ecclesiastes, it's what we're talking about. Ecclesiastes is all about the pursuits. It's all about the chase. It's all about searching and looking for the right things. As we've already seen, Solomon, like many of us today, pursued the wrong things. He talked about that. He'll talk about it again in the book. But the the message that leaps from Ecclesiastes, the message that makes this old book relevant for you and for me, is the message of the book, the challenge that leaps from these verses and from the whole book is this. You need to pursue God. And I need to pursue God. More than anything else in my life, we need to pursue God. He should be the object of our chase. He should be the object of our pursuit. A couple of practical applications. The first is this. You and I need to get a fresh glimpse of who God is. Quite frankly, our view of worship has diminished because our view of God has diminished. Allow that to sink in. Our view of worship has diminished because our view of God has diminished. I, I guarantee you if, if God allowed judgment to fall in any form whatsoever on the United States, churches would be full the very next week. It happened the week after 9-11. All of a sudden we realized, oh, God... God, we need you. All of a sudden, we, we, we were refocused. We realized that our definition of God didn't work. We needed to see God as he really was. And people flocked to houses of worship, seeking a fresh glimpse, a fresh view of God. Quite frankly, we're inconsistent in our worship. We're irreverent in our worship because we have, cha- we have made God into who we want him to be instead of who he is. We've lost that sense of reverential fear and awe for a holy God. And I tell you, what, what Brian needs more than anything else and what you need more than anything else is a fresh glimpse of the majesty, a fresh glimpse of the character, a fresh glimpse of the holiness of God. I promise you that if God physically showed up here today, your life would never be the same. Well, God's here. We need a fresh glimpse of him. Two illustrations are found in the Bible. The first is found in Isaiah chapter 6. In the first part of Isaiah's prophecy, if you've read through the book of Isaiah, he was, he was railing on the Israelites. You'll read those first five chapters, and he's looking at the Israelites saying, woe are you, woe are you, woe are you. I mean, he was giving them to him, man. He was giving it to him over and over and over again. That's the job of a prophet, to give it to him. And he was giving it to him. Until all of a sudden, he comes to Isaiah chapter 6. 
In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah catches a glimpse of God. Let me read it for you. Isaiah 6, 1. It was in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, that I saw the Lord. He was high. He was sitting on a lofty throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two wings they covered their feet. With two wings they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with their glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. If you have an older translation, he says, woe is me. You see, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he no longer looked at the faults of other people, but he saw his own faults. And when he saw a fresh glimpse of God, when he saw God in all of his holiness, it changed who Isaiah was. J John is a second example. You'll know that John, if you read the Gospel of John, you read the New Testament, John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. John was the one that, that was, you know, you know, the closest to Jesus. He was the guy that was leaning up against him. He was the guy, if, if Jesus had a best friend on earth, we could have said that it was John. John was there with Jesus all the time. In Revelation chapter 1, John catches a glimpse of Jesus, not in his earthly body as he had seen before, but John catches a glimpse of Jesus in all of his majesty, there in heaven, in all of his glory. And I find it interesting that John doesn't look at his friend Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, dude, how you doing, man? It's been a while. What you up to, dude? He falls at the feet of his friend as if he were dead. John saw Jesus in a new way. John saw Jesus in all of his majesty and it changed who John was. It changed the way that John responded to him. John caught a glimpse of Jesus' majesty, fell at his feet as though he were dead. Let me ask you this morning, how do you view God? Your view of God drastically affects your worship. Here's the last thing. I'm done. Not only do we need a fresh glimpse of who God is, but we need a fresh glimpse of how God is to be worshipped. It's so easy for us to have an incorrect view of worship. Human nature motivates us to worship either legalistically or selfishly. Those who, who have legalistic worship, worship out of obligation. That was some of us today. Oh, my word, i got to go to church this morning. So we come to church out of obligation. That's a legalistic view of worship. Others of us have not a legalistic view. We have a selfish view of worship. We worship out of personal ambition. Our worship is motivated by egotism. What can I get from God? Neither way pleases him. That's not how God desires to be worshipped. In John 4, 24, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, our word worship has kind of evolved. I don't like how it evolved. The word worship used to be spelled worth-ship. That's where our word worship comes from, worth-ship. It, 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 the, the word acknowledges the, the worthiness of an object, the worth of an object that is being worshipped. More than anything else, my worship, your worship, should acknowledge the fact that God alone is worthy. He is worthy. Listen, whether you know it or not today, God is awesome. He's awesome. He's wonderful. He's compassionate. He's patient. 
He's all powerful. He loves me even though I don't deserve to be loved. And he loves you even though you don't deserve to be loved. He is worthy this morning. He is completely worthy of the very best that we can give him. He's worthy of our best worship. He's worthy of our best services. He's worthy of our best time. He's worthy of our best offerings. He's worthy of the very best. Why? Because he's God. He's God that any moment could end your life and mine. Yet in his mercy, in his grace, he extended my life today for another year. And he extends yours. He is worthy. Does your worship demonstrate his worthiness? Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, next week, next month. Because tomorrow he's going to be just as worthy as he is today. And next week he's going to be just as worthy as today. And next Sunday he's going to be just as worthy of our worship as he is today. And next month, he's going to be just as worthy of our worship. And 1,000 years from now, he will be just as worthy of our worship. And 1 million years from now, he will be just as worthy of our worship. He is worthy. Solomon says, watch your step when you come in to the house of God. Worship in a way that demonstrates his worthiness. Mm -hmm.